Now is the next talk. I will give the, the uh, microphone to Susana Deustua. I think Susana, Susana is there. She is the chairwoman of this session. Are you there, Susana? I am here. Well, please. Thank uh, you. I invite you <laughs> to present the next speaker. All right. So, uh, hello to everyone worldwide in all your time zones. And I am also want, I also want to add my thanks to Awina for a very inspiring uh, start to this symposium. So, and our next speaker is John Hernshaw, who I've known for a long time and was my predecessor as Division C president. That's the Division on Education, Outreach, and Heritage. And um, I could go through all of John's biography, but the bottom line is that he's been an astronomer for a long, long time and been very active in education uh, and using astronomy for education. And he has traveled as a consequence to many countries around the world promoting um, research and the teaching of astronomy. And currently he is the IAU vice president. And I think I should just turn it over to John to let us know all about social revolutions in astronomy. It's the IAU strategic plan 2020-2030, a blueprint for forging a new social revolution in astronomy and using astronomy as a tool for building a progressive society. John. Thank you so much, Susanna. Uh, first of all, can you see my screen? Is it being shared? It says- Your, your screen is being shared and we see your PowerPoint slide, Good. which is at the can, uh, title. And you can hear me. Good. And so we can hear you. All set to go. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to the Scientific Organizing Committee for inviting me to give this talk. It's um, mainly on the strategic plan 2020 to 30, which uh, in fact, um, I was not a principal author of that. So really this talk should be given by Avine and Deborah Elmer Elmergreen, who were the principal authors of the um, strategic plan. But for some reason, I got invited uh, to give this talk. So thank you very much. First of all, a little bit of history. As you know, the IAU was founded over a century ago in 1919, in fact, and there were about 200 members originally. Um, that compares with 12 or actually 13,670 today in 82 different countries. And um, even some countries originally were barred from joining the IAU, so it wasn't truly global to start with because the countries, um, the so-called central powers of World War I were barred for several decades before they were, were allowed to join. So the first General Assembly of the IAU was in Rome in 1922. And here is a picture. Uh, excuse, me, excuse me, John, are you yes, showing yes. The, the slides? Because uh, we, we are uh, only see the first one. Really? Well, that's yes. too bad. Yeah. Now, what do I have to do? Do you, can you put that on in presenter mode? Your, your I PowerPoint? I am in presenter mode. What? Um, what, what we are seeing is just, the, is just the PowerPoint. You need to share a different screen. I had the same issue that it was not uh, uh, slightly different from uh, that you need to pick one of the other screens. Yeah, I think if you if you share the entire screen rather than just PowerPoint, then it, it may work. So I'm sharing screen now and I can see. You're not sharing your screen now. No? No. No, you, you stopped this. So start, so share your screen again. The button which says, I, I click the green arrow, up arrow, and then um, a screen appears which says share, but when I click on sh share, nothing happens. You should click on share, and then you should have options for what screen to share. 
Okay, you need to click. Uh, it is a little bit different uh, from usual. I noticed that as well. You need to click on the, the PowerPoint screen, basically. But you need to go to presenter mode uh, there. Can you see my first slide? Yes, we see your first slide. And I'm now going to presenter mode. Yeah. Now, yes. yes, that's yeah. good. Yes. And can you see the second slide? Yes. yes. Thank you. I think it's working. Good. <laughs> so um, here is a picture of the first General Assembly in Rome in 1922. And I think the very striking thing is that um, nearly all astronomers participating were elderly men. I think I might be able to see just one or possibly two women in that audience of um, the first General Assembly. And that really highlights one of the main points I want to emphasize that the IAU has changed enormously over the period of 100 years. I think the very start of that evolution was in 1946 with the establishment of Commission 38 for the exchange of astronomers. That commission operated from 1947 to 2009, and a total of 558 astronomers benefited from uh, funding to travel to another country for an exchange visit. So that was the first time the IAU was really engaged, not just with the practicalities of doing research, but actually involved with people. And that is the crucial thing that started with Commission 38. I think the next big development was Commission 46 for um, the uh, teaching of astronomy. And that was followed, uh, that was in 1964, followed by the first international school for young astronomers in uh, Manchester, England in 1967. Today we have had 42 international schools for young astronomers, the last one being in China, Kunming, um, last year. And about 1,500 um, people have now passed through these um, schools for young astronomers. Uh, they're graduate students, usually at PhD level. So, um, in 1994, the Working Group for the Worldwide Development of Astronomy was established, and I chaired that group for about 10 years. It uh, no longer exists today, but um, our group members traveled around the world to developing countries, giving uh, lectures and giving them advice on establishing um, astronomical programs, research and teaching. <clears throat> I think, um, these four officers, which uh, of astronomy, um, have been a crucial development, uh, all in the um, 21st century. And the Office of Astronomy for Development was established in Cape Town in 2010. Um, the Outreach Office in 2012 in Tokyo, the Office for Young Astronomers in 2015 in Oslo, and um, very recently the Education Office in Heidelberg, Germany. So this is the structure of the IAU today, an executive committee, nine divisions, 35 commissions, 53 working groups, and those four officers with professional staff employed in those offices. I think I want to highlight three of those working groups um, because they are fundamental in the way the IAU is now interacting with people and promoting careers in astronomy. In 2003, the IAU Working Group for Women in Astronomy was established. And then in 2015, that for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And in 2018, the Working Group for Junior Members. So these are three working groups that have made a real difference in how the IAU is interacting with people and promoting the careers of young astronomers. And at the executive committee meeting last year, I know we discussed the possibility of a working group for amateur astronomers. Uh, I think that's still under discussion, but that could be uh, a further development involving um, uh, people. So I think a social revolution has been launched by the IAU, uh, going from an 
inward looking body concerned with the details of how to do research, such things as classification schemes and standard stars, and now to an outward looking organization, especially since World War II, where it's um, involved with people, um, supporting women in science, supporting young astronomers in their careers, engaging with the public, um, engaging with developing countries, uh, with amateur astronomers, and even with astro-tourism, people who travel to dark sky places to admire the beauty of the night sky. And the IAU is engaging with astronomers with um, impaired um, uh, impairments such as visually impaired or he hearing compa uh, impaired or mobility impaired and helping them to appreciate developments in astronomy. So I think astronomy is now being used as a way to promote the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics in schools and universities. And I think it's, it's um, very significant that the IAU uh, will soon have had four female presidents, three of them in succession. And that, um, I think, sends a strong signal to the world that the IAU means business to um, move towards uh, gender equality. And there's still some way to go, but this is a very important development. Uh, we've, had, uh, two, we've had three female presidents, soon to be four, when Deborah Elmer Green becomes the next president. So this is from the strategic plan of 2020 to 30, which was adopted at the last General Assembly in Vienna in 2018. And it shows how astronomy is interacting with many different um, sciences, maths and statistics, biology, earth sciences, chemistry and physics. Those are the green circles. It involves um, technology such as optics, um, big data and computing, electronics and space science, but also it interacts with culture and society. And I think that's the most important thing so far as this uh, symposium is concerned. The education um, using astronomy, inspiration of people by astronomy, philosophy and anthropology. We start asking the big questions of where life came from on Earth and how Homo sapiens has evolved on Earth. So the strategic plan of 2020 to 30, which by the way is the second strategic plan, has five goals. The first one is the more traditional goal of promoting scientific research in astronomy. I want to concentrate on goals numbers two, three, four, and five. Number two is um, the advancement, um, the inclusive advancement in the field of astronomy in every country. Number three is um, to use astronomy as a tool for development in the, every country. That's uh, social and economic development. And goal four is that the IEU engages with the public, and that's especially, of course, the Office of Astronomy Outreach in Tokyo. And goal five is uh, the IAU stimulates the use of astronomy for teaching and education, which is very pertinent to this symposium. So goal number one is um, about scientific research, and that's the traditional area for the IAU's engagement. And here are some of the big projects which are listed in the strategic plan, um, covering most of the electromagnetic spectrum and also, of course, now gravitational waves. And there are some of the big projects for the near future. I think the only branch that's a little bit deficient is ultraviolet astronomy, but you can see visible infrared um, and radio are all very strongly represented. As for goal number two, the inclusive advancement, uh, let's look at the global distribution of um, astronomical activities promoted by the IAU. It's, it is very global, though the continent of Africa does seem a little bit deficient, um, and that's um, work for the future, obviously, but the IAU is being very active to address that problem. And then if we look at the gender balance um, in the IAU, 
Um, ideally, we would have 50% female, 50% male in all countries. That's certainly not the case yet. It's typically um, 10 to 11 to 20%, which are countries colored green. Um, some outstanding countries uh, have, done, have done somewhat better than that, especially so in Latin America, which I'm pleased to say Argentina is way up there with a large percentage of female astronomers. And a few other countries stand out as well, but you can see that from the colors on the map. Goal two um, <clears throat> includes, um, uh, well, I will mention IAU Symposium 358 um, for um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which took place in Tokyo last year. And Avine also mentioned the sign language for hearing impaired people. Um, to uh, there is astronomical words have been translated into sign language. There's a new code of ethics which um, came into force. Um, uh, I say this year. I, I can't remember now. I think it was beginning of this year, and I helped uh, write some of that so with an anti-harassment policy and um, well, it's a code of conduct involving anti-harassment and a code of ethics. Um, the IU is supporting prizes, the Gruber Cosmology Prize, Kavli Prize, the fairly new Shaw Prize, and also fairly new PhD prizes uh, in all nine divisions. And we are promoting the careers of young astronomers through the international schools, which uh, Itzia Aretzaga in Mexico and David Mota in Norway are um, the current directors. And we now have junior members, 717 junior members. That's a new category of membership of the IAU. And they are planning an annual Young Astronomers Meeting. And there is um, a poster from the strategic plan concerning the sign language. And there is Itzia and David Mota, who are running these uh, international schools. Um, and that picture, I think, is from the last one in Kunming, China. Goal number three is using astronomy to promote um, development in countries and the OAD in Cape Town, uh, directed by Kevin Govinder, has been extraordinarily successful in um, projects um, for astronomy development. And here are some of the projects worldwide and just about every country except I see Australia, New Zealand and Greenland. Um, have benefited from um, OAD projects in recent years. And the IUU is, uh, through OAD, is supporting the UN Strategic Sustainable Development Goals. And at least half of those 17 goals um, have some direct involvement of uh, IAU. And those ones with arrows pointing to them where IOU is having some uh, involvement in these sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And that's, I think, very important. So this is what the IA, uh, OAD is doing for the next 10 years, uh, as taken from the strategic plan. And um, at least half of the strategic um, uh, sustainable development goals um, are impacted and um, using astronomy and its te technology to position young people for career opportunities, interdisciplinary partnerships, and to source the necessary funding. Two more so minutes, the, John. It has a, um, a number of um, regional offices and language offices um, promoting astronomy in different countries. So. I'll, and they are also uh, extending the global reach of the OAD. So goal number four concerns the um, outreach and based in Tokyo and in Japan. And they um, facilitate international, international communication through exchanges and translations. Um, they have NOx, the um, national outreach coordinators in many countries and they um, provide open databases um, for astronomical information and encourage communication of science. 
And one thing they also do is promote dark skies. And as Avine mentioned, um, we've just had um, a workshop on dark and quiet skies, uh, a virtual workshop on, on, on dark skies and uh, satellite constellations. So um, that's been an important aspect uh, also for OAO. And just recently, the IAU issued a new communications policy. So national outreach coordinators uh, span the entire world, um, representing 127 countries. As you can see from this map, the dark green countries have NOx already. So dark and quiet skies. Uh, we've had our workshop uh, in October, and we hope to have a um, in-person um, conference in La Palma, Canary Islands in April, if the pandemic so permits. But what we have just about done and about to publish is a report of 270 pages to the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It's a UN committee on dark and quiet skies. <clears throat> so the office is based in Tokyo and Hidehiko Agata and Nina Kanas. I'm sure they're both online at present. They um, are directing um, this office. So the CAP journal, Communicating Astronomy to the Public, is an important activity. And the conference, roughly every second year, uh, CAP conference, are two of the very important programs done by OAO. And here are some of the actions of OAO for the decade 2020-30. Um, increase the network of NOx, the National Outreach Coordinators. Facilitate international communication through exchanges and translations, and so on. And promote the dark sky and blue dot message is the last item there. So goal number five is all to do with education. So perhaps that's the most pertinent for um, this symposium. And um, the education office is, is about to establish a network of national astronomy education coordinators. And um, encourage standards for teacher training, organize an annual international school for astronomy education. That will be very interesting. And then there's the annual Shaw Prize IAU workshop on astronomy education and build a database of volunteer IAU members. So the um, education um, office is based at Haus der Astronomie in Heidelberg. And there's a picture of that very futuristic building um, shaped like a, a spiral galaxy. And Marcus Purcell is the director of OAE, and that's um, linked to the Max Planck Institute and supported by the Klaus Thierer Stiftung and Karl Zeiss Stiftung. So I think another important development in the overall strategic plan is that the IU has very considerable ambitions. They cost money. And the IU this year appointed uh, Genevieve Marshall to be a, um, a professional fundraiser with quite ambitious targets on funding, which will be raised over the, the next several years. So I think the IU has started a social revolution it's not just a revolution to promote astronomy, but it's a revolution to advance society as a whole, to build a progressive society and um, with more liberal thinking than the very conservative approach that the IAU had adopted in 1919 on its founding. But there's still work to do. And I think in the future, what we should um, hope to see is more engagement with amateur astronomers, especially those who want to contribute to research with the professional community. We for, should form uh, strategic alliances for outreach with planetariums, public outreach observatories, and those museums with astronomy or space divisions. I think there's a lot of work to do there because these organizations are also promoting astronomy to the public. So they're doing some of our work for us. We should work with them to see that development. 
astrotourism in dark sky places, working with the International Dark Sky Association, I think is a very important area for future collaboration. Astrotourism really started in a big way around the world about the beginning of this century, and it's growing very strongly in many countries, including my country of New Zealand. And the Starlight Declaration, I should remind you, was uh, declared in 2009 by the Starlight Foundation, and it declares the right of all people to have um, a view of the pure, um, unpolluted, starry night sky and to appreciate its beauty. So I'd say those are areas where the IU needs to expand its activities over the coming decade. So astrotourism John. is a new field for engagement, and I think that brings me to the end of my talk. I, have I gone over time, Susanna? I, just a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> about a, <laughs> about a minute. Late. You started start late. late, I know, I know. <laughs> so there are some questions for you on the chat. One question is, was, the, uh, was it a conscious effort to move the IAU into a more diverse organization? I think, um, I think it, there were some key people um, who um, promoted this and um, the founding of the Education Commission 46, I think, well, obviously that was a very conscious thing uh, that happened. And um, so, to some extent, Commission 38, um, they were pioneers who um, did this. So, um, yes, it, it was a, a conscious effort by some key people. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, it's really more of a comment is regarding alliances for inclusive astronomy. It would be great to create links with different national associations for the blind and visually impaired, hearing impaired, and so forth. This was a comment from Amelia Bayo. Well, yes, I, I must admit, I'm not familiar with uh, international organizations for um, visually impaired people. I'm sure such organizations do exist. And I would um, presume that OAO in Tokyo is making contact with um, organizations that support the visually impaired and um, helping promote um, astronomy to um, people with poor sight. And I'm sure they can be inspired um, to a great extent by learning about the universe, even if they can't see it like uh, most people can. Right, and I'm, I just wanna add one comment to that. There is a working group within the IEU on equity and inclusion in astronomy. Absolutely, that, yes. That would be a good place to join and participate and push for these strategic alliances. And then there's one last question. Um, would you talk a little bit more about astrotourism in dark sky places? Well, astrotourism is really becoming extremely important because there are over 200 dark sky places which have received accreditation from International Dark Sky Association or from the Starlight Foundation in the Canary Islands and also the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has been active in, um, in accrediting dark sky places in Canada. So there are many dark sky places around the world and many of them you can go to and have a guided night sky tour. So I certainly am familiar that um, until the pandemic started, um, people were crossing the globe to go to the best places to see the night sky. And um, Lonely Planet, by the way, just um, produced a guide to um, dark skies, um, which was published, I think, last year. 
which um, um, it um, highlights many of the best places on the planet you can travel to um, for appreciating the night sky and the beauty of the Milky Way, for example. But of course, 2020 has not been a great year for astrotourism, as everyone knows, but surely this will pick up again, um, in ne perhaps next year or the year after. So I think it's a strongly growing movement. Astrotourism actually goes back a long time um, Camille Flammarion in France in the 1880s promoted um, astrotourism, but really the idea of traveling halfway around the world to see a beautiful night sky, I think um, goes back perhaps 20 or at most 30 years. Okay, well, thank you, John. And Thank you. I, was, I just had a weird echo. Um, so thank you again, John, for your presentation. And I hope that people are in, take inspiration as well from the strategic plan to move forward and make changes. And there are no more questions. So I think it is time to Thanks. turn it over to our Thanks, next Susanna. host. Thank you very much, uh, John. And thank you very much, Susanna. You were almost on time. So perfect, as usual. Thank you very much. Uh,